I should probably get started. For the guys in the back, I love the fact that you're a clock. Because I just say, like, how much more time do I have? And, and, and like, it's like, Alexa, how much more time do I have? And you go, like, 21 minutes. I'm like, yeah, thanks, Alexa. That's great. Uh, finally, something that Alexa is good for. And I, please don't send everything I say to Amazon uh, when I talk to you. So how much more time do I have, Alexa? How much? 39 minutes. OK. OK, so welcome back, everybody, um, to uh, looking at uh, LTI Advantage inside Sakai 19. So, so LTI Advantage for Sakai 19 was my contribution to our story. We always have like a story for every release. And there's like a couple of bullet points. And then we put it in our marketing and our presentations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So LTI has had a long history. It certainly started here at uh, a Sakai meeting in 2004, uh, back when Blackboard was afraid of us. Uh, so LTI 1.0 came out of that. Common Cartridge came out of that. Um, if you go back to the uh, to 2008, 2000 through 2012, the adoption of these standards was uh, I had to sort of make them myself, and I had to write all the sample code, and I had to beg everybody, and that's why I have this LTI tattoo on my shoulder. Uh, LTI Advantage is completely not like that. Um, in a way, I am not even counted as a leader of LTI Advantage at this point, uh, partly because um, I spent a lot of time thinking it was a stupid idea. And I just said, you guys are going to waste your time just like you did with LTI 2. You're going to go off the deep end, and you're going to come up with all these stupid ideas. And, and I said, like, you just go ahead and do it, and I'll just read it when you're done, and I'll implement it in Sakai if I like it. Um, but then something happened. And I hate to say that the addition of Google and Microsoft to the working group is a good thing, but it was, um, in that uh, LTI was going to be, 1.3 was going to be kind of a hack. But then when Microsoft and Google came, they're like, you should do this with OAuth 2. Uh, you should do this with Java Web Tokens. You should do this, and you should do this, and you should do this. And it kind of took us at least 18 more months to finish it once they started messing with our little kind of closed, isolated world. And we produced a standard that really fits nicely in the panoply of like talking to Google or talking to Twitter or whatever. And we followed a lot of those patterns. And all the LMS vendors needed no encouragement whatsoever. Uh, Canvas, Blackboard, um, Moodle were aggressive. Now, Moodle itself is not aggressive. Cengage is paying Moodle to be aggressive through, through Unicon, but it doesn't matter. The big five are going to have it, Canvas, Blackboard, and they are rolling it out fast. I mean, their summer conferences are coming, it's an, and there's going to be all kind of LTI Advantage stuff at all the conferences, at all the places, except Moodle, because Moodle just is being doing what they're paid to do. But we're in there. And uh, so what happened for me is uh, about a year ago, I went to a learning impact meeting with this sort of like scowl on my face that says, this is all going to turn out badly. And then there were, they brought some sample code. Turn it, turns out Turnitin brought sample code to that meeting. And I'm like, oh, that's easy. So then I just started from last year till now on a sprint to put it into Sakai and to put it into uh, El, uh, Tsugi just because I kind of fell in love with it a year ago. So I was kind of curmudgeonly up to that point. A uh, thing that's completely different that in terms of standards pr production, I sort of talked about how hard it was to build LTI um, and how I just went places to try to tell people and drum up interest. It's easy now. We've got a Slack channel where I can get to Canvas, Cengage, Moodle, Blackboard, started to learn developers, and I can posit a question, and in about five minutes, we're discussing the question. It is unlike anything I've ever seen where an entire, the engineers from a billion dollar market with fiercely competitive companies are sitting in a Slack channel. It's so awesome, it might actually be illegal. It's just awesome how fast we think through ideas with the right people at these things. The other thing that's really cool about this is the, um, the problem that standards have had historically in the marketplace is that product planning gets involved. And they're like, from a LMS, like common cartridge 1.3, should we adopt it or not? And then a product planner goes like, 
Well, I am getting no dis I'm getting no one in the marketplace that wants it. And they're like, yeah, well, maybe it's because it doesn't exist yet and you just should do it. But that's not how they think about it. They're like, well, we're not making any more money, so we'll put that on a back burner. So what's happened now is LTI Advantage is like front burner. And there's no product planner who's going to go at Blackboard and say, you know, we need to push that back a year because no one's complaining about it. No. There's like a dedicated developer in Blackboard that pretty much spends three quarters of their time on LTI Advantage and no one bugs that person. Just like I spend my time on LTI Advantage for Sakai and no one's telling me stop working on LTI Advantage and go work on the rubrics tool, right? I'm just like, I'm not going to work on the rubrics tool, I'm going to work on LTI Advantage and the same thing is true for Blackboard. They have dedicated developers in these, uh, in the, in these products, so that's pretty cool. You can do your own demo. If you go to dev1.sakaicloud.com, if we got time, I'll show you all this. You can actually do a link in lessons. You go to an Aperio 2019 thing. Um, you can log in as an instructor. You make a site, go to lessons and gradebook, and then add apps. I've got debugging turned on. I'll, sh I'll show you screenshots of all this, but you can do all this. And if you really want to see the administrator, I wrote some cool documentation in Sugi about how to connect Sugi into Sakai, and you can do this. Um, with Dev1 Sugi Cloud, and there's instructions on how to do that um, if you want to play with that. And it's got documentation about what's going on. I, get, I, I just realized that I'm going to answer these questions so many times, so I might as well just write good documentation up front. And that's what the document is. It tells you how to bring things in, how to connect, how the keys work, what to cut and paste back and forth, because it's a lot more complex than LTI 1.1. And so, in L, this, is, this is an example of what you might see. LMS test is an LTI link. And right now, I've got debug turned on. And this is, this is the internal structure of a thing called a Java web token. A Java web token is, instead of being post data, key value post data, uh, URL form encoded stuff, this is just a single large post document that's just a bunch of JSON, but it's got signatures. And so this is, this is like, and there's, if you scroll down, you see signatures and the encoded stuff. But this is basically the decoded version of a Java web token. I have built a tool that turns out to be very useful for all the LMS vendors called the, the, the LTI, the, I think it's called uh, LTI test, that basically you launch it and it, it has a series of buttons that allows you to test every single one of the LTI uh, services. So you can retrieve rosters, you can retrieve uh, gradebook columns, you can add and just update and change gradebook columns, and it's all right there. And you can do all this stuff from that, from here. Come on. From there, from this Dev1 Sakai Cloud. If you log in and you make an account and join that site, you can click on these things and then you can explore all those protocols. And then you can even explore the low-level protocols and you see what kind of roster data that Sakai is giving. And what's really cool is I've given Sugi, Sugi instances to Canvas, Blackboard, Moodle, and Desire to Learn, and they sit and they launch and they use this to test their implementation. Now that, that's going to accomplish one of two things. Well, it's going to accomplish one thing for sure. Sugi's implementations of calling these services is going to work on every LMS. And I've been invited to speak at uh, Blackboard DevCon uh, and at Canvas Con and at Desire to Learn, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a Sugi talk with a Canvas branded Sugi and a at Canvas and a D2L branded Sugi at D2L, and show them how to plug Sugi into D2L, and D2L will show them. So the Blackboard engineer, who we're good friends, all his demos are just using Sugi because Sugi's awesome and it works for him. So. You can do that. This is the uh, content item. It's now called deep linking, where you're going out and pulling stuff in. If you're using Sugi, like Dayton, uh, you don't change anything. It just knows, Sugi knows if it's LTI 1.3 or 1.1, and it just changes back and forth. Um, so here's a bit of the technical underpinning. Um, the uh, login, the launch, is really a, uh, an abbreviated OpenID Connect flow. What's cool about OpenID Connect flow for us is that OpenID Connect Flow was in the market like five or so years ago, and it was a little hard back then, but now like every freaking language has all these libraries sitting there. You'd be surprised at how much less code I wrote for LTI 1.3 for security, authentication, signatures, et cetera. Um, and so OAuth 2.0, it really looks like you're talking to Google. And I, 
when I was talking OWA 2.0 in Sugi and PHP up to Sakai, I turned out that in Sugi already had the library for signing of Java Web Tokens in it because I had done a Google integration and it was the same library. I literally am using the same library to talk to Sakai and PHP as I am in Google, which means that those libraries are tested, right? I didn't write my own. In OAuth 1.0, I mean in LTI 1, we kind of wrote our own stuff and that was both good and bad because we could get there in LTI 1.1, but now we're kind of lagging these core technologies. There's a membership and roles uh, outcome service for the gradebook, and I talked in other talks about how uh, publishers will be able to um, begin to increasingly ignore the existence of the learning management system and just sort of put the columns in they feel like. The learning management system will stop making columns. They'll just let the vendor do it. So this is a, uh, actually this is not a deep linking launch. This is just, an, well it's both for deep linking, but this is really an LTI 1.3 launch. And this is a thing, so if you'll watch in your browser while you're launching, there's a couple of steps. And it has to do with trusted endpoints and URLs. So if you click on that LMS test, it actually sends to a SUGI URL called the OpenIDC Connect Initialization URL, and it says, I'm about to launch you. And then what this guy does is effectively creates like a cross-site scripting token, sends that cross-site scripting token back. Now this is all happening with just redirects in the browser. That the user sees a click, then it comes back and then gets this sort of cross-site scripting replay attack token, and then it actually sends the real launch. In one, OAuth 1. I mean, in, in, in uh, LTI 1.1, you kind of go straight to this launch, straight to get some data, sign it, send it. Um, and so then this is, makes a Java web token with a public-private keys. All that stuff that seems scary is not scary because there's such good libraries for it. So the lines of code that I had to wrote to make this work and then it does this thing called a tool redirect endpoint. So if you have a bunch of deep links like to chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, you don't actually launch to the chapter one link anymore. You launch to the, you launch to the same place to get it started. And then um, you, 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 then, then you, then this is the, where you set the session up and then the tool itself redirects to chapter one, chapter two. So this target link URI is kind of, it used to be that this launch launched all the way to here. And this uses PKI, and they have these things called key set URLs. So this is signed on this side with a private key and checked on this side with a public key. And that public key is retrieved with a, with a wide open URL. And so it's all PKI, a public private key. And again, that sounds scary, but with libraries, it ain't scary. I mean, that part was the getting the signatures and public private key stuff to work was the easiest part of all this. So again, you pretty much in the old days of LTI 1.1, you just went from here to there. <laughs> Click it, boom, right to there. So now we got all this stuff. And just one other little subtle thing here, this, this uh, uh, OIDC initialization actually communicates back for tool redirect endpoint. Um, and those, so there's actually a set of these things. And so if you're a big company like Turnitin and you want to keep all the data uh, uh, in Canada in Canada, you actually can have a set of what are called tool redirect endpoints and then you can get this first thing that has no personal identifying information in it, and you can say, oh, you're from Canada, which means I want the next step to go to a Canadian URL, or you're from Europe, I detect you're from Europe, I'm gonna send you to a European URL. And so this doesn't, in a sense, this, this has to be somewhere global, but then this can be uh, uh, geographically uh, different. So there's lots of reasons for this complexity, both from a security perspective and there's something you'll be seeing upcoming in LTI 1.1 that sort of begins to uh, look a lot like this, but that is the launch flow. So LTI 1 used a, sh a simple shared secret for, for launches and services, but now we use a pair of public uh, private keys. The setup in some ways is more complex and there are bigger blobs of crap to copy back and forth, although we're moving away from that and moving towards URLs to move that data between the tool and the platform and from the platform to the tool. So in OAuth, you had a shared secret. Uh, LTI 1, you had a shared secret that you copied both sides. In, in, uh, in LTI 1, 3, you have two public-private key pairs. And so the tool has its own private key. The LMS has its own private key. They sign with that. And then 
they, they grab each other's public key and check to see if it's the right one. And so the, where they get the URL to get the public key is actually pre-configured because uh, then you could like say, hey, I'm going to launch a thing to you and look here for the public key. And yes, you could. And, and so it's a way to guarantee the sanctity of the public keys. So I got a bunch of code written in Java. I got a bunch of code written in uh, 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 PHP. And I got unit tests for all this stuff. And, and if you look at the unit tests, it's like, it's like that much code. And I just love that. This is the kind of information that you're copying back and forth. Like there's this client ID, there's this public key, the private key. Or, um, the way they did it when we first started was that the LMS generates a private key and hands it to uh, the tool because they believe that the tools would not be smart enough to produce their own private keys. That was kind of two years ago before we realized that this public private key stuff is easy and it's not hard for tools to do it. So we're going to move away from this. And, but if you go to like a, a Google integration, you get basically a client ID and a, and, a, and a secret, and then you copy and paste that into your thing. This is like the secret, the client ID and the secret are the way for the tool to call back. So these are for messages signed by the tool, and that's how we did it. But people want us to change that now and move to a, a more responsible way of doing it. This whole thing about um, this key set URL, it means that you can actually rotate keys, and it means that Sakai has a public-private key pair here that it actually makes up. Um, and it makes up a public-private key pair, s signs with a private key, and then puts the public key in a key set URL. And there's this thing called a key ID. And if, that, if it sees, the tool sees a key ID it's never seen before, it grabs a key set URL, which means that Sakai can change its secret like in between launches, right? So you can change your PKI public-private keys, regenerate them as often as you like. So that's really cool. So inside Sugi, and this is documented, um, there used to just be a thing where you had a key. Now, the, the key has now kind of been defined as tenant. So if you are going to Piazza and you're Dayton, you say, hey, I'm Dayton. Give me a key. And that, that key is somehow hooked to a charge, like Dayton has to pay money for Piazza every month or whatever it is. And so um, that is becoming a tenant. And this is actually critical for the LTI 1.1 to LTI Advantage transition. And so like the old OAuth consumer key is like a tenant. That is, a, think of it as like a, someone who's going to get a bill. Because that's how it worked in LTI 1.1. I'm going to give you a key. You're going to give me a credit card. And I'll give you a key in secret and some URLs. So what happens in LTI 1.3 is you actually first create a public-private key pair relationship with all these like URLs, the key set URL, the bearer token URL, which I'll talk about in a second, this authentication URL, which is the place that it sends it back to the LMS to do the kind of the replay attack, uh, et cetera. So you build this, but then you could have one of these public-private key arrangements for, uh, this could be like uh, Dayton or umich.edu, and then you can have a number of tenants. So this might be the school of business or somebody. So you can have a school that, you know, one school does Piazza, but the other one doesn't, right? So that's another tenant. And so you can think of this issuer as a drop down. It's like, which public private key pair are we doing in the school of business? And this is how LTI 1.1 to 1.3 uh, transition happens. So you've got a key and a secret already. If Piazza is going to do it, and they're not because they're idiots, but that's a different story. Um, I did it in Sugi. You have a key and a secret working already. And then you basically, if you want to add 1.3 to this tenant, that tenant is the key and secret that you've had all along. But you say, I'm going to go with this as the signing pair. And then this is the deployment ID within it. And, that, and so what will happen in Sakai is it's a little different. So if you're doing this in Canvas, in Sakai, this would be um, udayton.edu, right? And then this client ID would go for you, Dayton, and then this deployment ID would always be one in Sakai. But what happens if you're in Blackboard SAS is that, oh, yeah, this part right here is blackboard.com. It's not ucla.blackboard.com. And, um, and it's one client ID for all Blackboards. So one of the things that's going to happen in Canvas and D2L and Blackboard is the key and the secret are actually going to be managed on a Blackboard Turnitin relationship. So there'll be a Blackboard and a Canvas, and they're going to have one private key and one secret to talk to everybody. 
And then what will happen, it's not a bad thing, what will happen is then they'll make this deployment ID some big long number and that'll be like UCLA or University of Michigan or Dayton or whatever. And this can still be a key and a secret so that the University of Michigan or Dayton can connect their former LTI 1.1 self with a new deployment ID. Now in Sakai, again, deployment ID is always one, but then you pick an issuer. So you'd pick blackboard.com, client ID, UCLA 12345, or whatever that thing is. And so it's kind of broken the security and the billing into two pieces. There's the security part, but in Sakai, and Moodle does it this way as well, uh, Sakai and Moodle basically allow each school to have their own private keys because if you're hosted behind a firewall and you're the federal government or the army or somebody, you really don't want to have this URL be canvas.com. You don't. Or if you're in Turkey, you don't want it to be canvas.com. You just don't. Because, like, what? You want public private key pairs bouncing around? But the big guys don't care about that. They don't really care about anybody who can't afford to be American then, or pretend like they're American, like Europeans or whatever. And so they don't care. It's easy for them. And I made it, and Sugi can do either one. Uh, Java Web Tokens, uh, like I mentioned, are the form of data to go back and forth. Uh, they're this big, long, uh, base 64 encoded thing, but really it's nothing more than some really pretty uh, um, JSON. There's a really cool JWT.io that we all use during debugging. The JSON Web Token people are cool. They have the site about how to use it, and you can debug them, and you paste one in. This is kind of like the base string except it's base64 encoded and so there's a lot of things in the LTI one, uh, LTI 1 base string that was a mess. This is like super elegant and and it just we've had no trouble with this whatsoever. Uh, PKI rotation, I mentioned this. There is this thing called a key ID which is I use it as just a hash on the public key but allows Sakai to rotate its key set and an upcoming release will make it so that even Sugi can up rotate its key set completely separately. Right now, we don't have an automated way to have allow key rotation. Part of the thing that got us going on LTI 1.3 is that people like Canvas and Blackboard did audits of what the secrets were, and they found that they were quite often either secret or 0000, zero, zero, zero or ignored. And so now you can't do this without a, a much more responsible way of doing business. And now Canvas and Blackboard and Sakai we can make a process where you as an admin can say, rotate my primary key. I haven't got to the point where I've got it cron yet, but you could just go put in two, a new public-private key pair and hit save, and then Sakai would just be launching with that, and the tools would be getting this thing called the key set URL to get that new key. So key rotation is like big and awesome. You lose a key in LTI 1.1, and you're like, oh, crap. We've got to find a bunch of things and fix a bunch of things. Yeah. I think I said that. Got code for that. This is just kind of an expanded version of what these things look like. We've got like the deployment IDs in here, uh, and they're just these claims that we put in, but this is still just JSON. The writing of the code and the parsing of this stuff is simple and elegant and very, very beautiful. And I've got library routines in PHP and Java that handle this stuff really nice. So the other part of it is that's all the launch, but the services. How long do I got, Alexa? Alexa went out to have a coffee. 17 minutes, okay. Um, <clears throat> that's not like the future. It's not cloud-hosted Alexa, because Alexa went and got coffee. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so we have these OAuth 2 ser services, and the key to OAuth 2 services, um, and I used to think this was the stupidest idea until I built it, and then I'm like, oh man, this is cool. So the way it works is there is a, a private key on the tool and a public key on the platform. Currently, these are hand transported in a very short time period. These are going to be auto generated, and, and the public key will be sent by a URL, which will make provisioning a lot easier. But again, our first version came out. We didn't fix that in the first version because we just could have fixed so many things. So there's a private key here and a public key here. And so you want to sign a jot in there, and you go to what's called a token endpoint. Now, if, you, if you're a Sakai developer, what's going on in this token endpoint? Is, and then what you get is this token back, and that's kind of like a session ID. It's a session ID, and you cache it, and then all when you talk to service, it's like, you know, give me the roster, open a, make me a database, make me a, a, a gradebook column, make me this. You pass the token as just a pure bearer. There's no signing, there's no nothing. You got a header, you throw this token in. That token doesn't last very long. The tokens last about a, a, an hour, 3,600 seconds, and then they throw them away. 
And so what happens is you might be doing this. You, you have a time inside this token that says, that don't be using this more than 3,600 seconds. And if you're keeping track, then you'll just go get another one and update your cache. Or you'll say, you hit a service and like, hey, sorry, time's up, get me a new one. And then it goes back to the high security thing of the public-private key pair. And so that, that's cool and that's fine. But what's even cooler, that's like super awesome from a Sakai developer perspective. And this is why I'd like to see us sort of adopt this in some of our APIs, now that I, I used to hate it, but now I love it, is that this token endpoint, if you look at the code in Sakai that does the token endpoint, if you know how we do stuff in Sakai, like if you uh, look in the resources tool and you got a delete button, it asks Sakai, does the current logged in user have the permission to delete this file? If it does, it shows a delete button. That's called sort of security.unlock inside of Sakai. And so what happens is, is that in these token requests, what you're doing is you're saying, give me a token to allow me to do the following things. I would like to be able to delete, add gradebook columns and send grades. And then what happens is, is this then hits our database kind of hard and it looks up who you are, what kind of thing we gave to that and all the check boxes inside of the Sakai LTI thing says, does this, is this tool allowed to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C, cha, 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 think, 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 security unlock, security unlock. And then we create a signed JWT that we hand back as the token, which actually includes the authorizations that this tool is now granted. And it's signed by another public-private key that we put inside here that Earl is going to help me make go across all of the servers in a, cl in a clustered environment one of these days. But we have a, this is a yet another public-private key that is just silently generated by Sakai and could be rotated every 30 minutes. And then, but I sign it and say this can read and write this and it can do this and I just put those out as strings but it's signed and then what I do here is I simply check the signature which is actually in the memory of the servlet and I say you know what I previously five minutes ago I checked and I knew that you could create gradebook columns bam create a gradebook column so I don't have to call the security service in all of these things right and that's why this is an outstanding model for an API and Google made it up, so I guess it's not surprising that they kind of figured out how to put the costly things up here that happens every hour, once per hour per tool, and the least the cheap that makes these things really cheap. And it just is a super elegant architecture, and I just absolutely love it. And this is just me playing with the line item service. Whoa, crap. I got lots of code for tokens, and I hand these to people, and people outside of Sakai and Sugi use these things. I have test unit tests for all this stuff. I'm not always the best at building unit tests, but because I was in such a hurry, I was writing unit tests, and I was asking all these other people who had expertise in Java and PHP, because I got a lot of stuff from learning objects and a lot of stuff from, I mean, Blackboard was giving me code. They were taking, cutting, pasting code from their implementation because they were ahead of me, and they would hand it to me in Slack, and I put it in Sakai. Don't tell anybody I said that, right? I'm not sure he actually had the lawyer's permission to send me code. But so what I would take code from Blackboard, and I would turn it into a unit test to prove how these APIs worked, and then I like just wrote the code inside of Sakai after I knew the unit tests were perfect. And so I was sitting there with all these people building unit tests, stealing code from Turnitin, and stealing code from Blackboard, and stealing code from learning objects, and I built all these. And then it's like, oh, falling off a log because my unit tests work great. And so, and so this is an asset that I've got that I give away is all this code in PHP and Java that has good unit tests that shows you how to do Java Web Tokens, OAuth 2, tokens, signing, all that stuff. So um, I've said this a couple times. Um, this was an amazing experience for me. Uh, I've never seen so much cooperation across vendors. I mean, they, they, they stab each other in the back with sales and marketing, but uh, the, the engineers are totally committed to the success of the other engineers. And it kind of is an open source culture amongst engineers at these closed source companies, and I consider them all friends at this point, and I think they would say the same of me. Um, so the bad news is, um, and, and and Matthew sort of experienced this, is I, I don't always have a good reaction when people ask me about LTI anymore because I spent so much time getting people to use LTI 1.1 and I would hand them sample code and they would build highly irresponsible implementations. And so I promised myself that by the time LTI Advantage comes out, I would not tell people how to build irresponsible implementations. Um, but the market is strong for irresponsible implementations. Um, 
And so I've kind of said, if you want to know how to do LTI, look at SUGI. And they go, that's too hard. And I'm like, well, then don't talk to me. So I'm kind of a jerk about that. Um, and, uh, and so I thought that we would not have code that would encourage lousy implementations. But Turnitin has produced a really great thing. And I stole a lot of code out of Turnitin's open source little, SUGI, uh, little test harness to make SUGI. But I did a responsible thing. But unfortunately, that is the quick and dirty way to get LTI 1.3 to work in a lot of tools. And I think we're going to see a horrible number of bad LTI 1.3 tools. The same people that built bad LTI 1.21 tools are going to be bad LTI 1.3 tools. Uh, the fact that everyone's sassifying makes things a lot more complex. This notion of this, the key and secret used to be scoped to tenant, and now the key and secret are scoped to vendor. And client I and uh, deployment ID is what does it. So the transition is going to be bad. And, it, and the thing that's a complicating factor is the sassification, because the scoping of the keys and the secrets is much bigger from the big three. <coughs> now, I just heard on Slack that Blackboard is going to have a solid transition strategy, which surprises the crap out of me, because I know that if you're sassifying, Transitioning from LTI 1.1 to LTI Advantage is really hard. And that means that Blackboard has effectively changed their data model internally dramatically. They have a, a batch process that goes and patches all the LTI 1.1. And actually, they do that pretty well. Uh, they, they have got it. So if, if they're going to do a transition, it's amazing, which I'm really happy about because right now I haven't heard word one about Canvas or Desire to Learn doing a transition. The only people that actually do transition right are Sakai and Moodle, but I think Blackboard's going to do it. Now, the one thing that's different between Sakai Moodle approach and Blackboard approach is that Sakai and Moodle approach can be sort of run in parallel and or go on forwards and backwards, where the Blackboard approach is a one-time conversion, and you can never go back. Right Now, I, I think the Blackboard approach is fine. It's the only way you could do it if you're also going to sassify, because we're not going to sassifying it at the same time. Um, we're going to have an elegant transition. I mean, literally, I mean, I got documentation on how to do it, and you just take your existing keys and Sugi. If the, if, but the tools are going to suck. The tools are not going to do transition well at all. They, it's too hard. It was hard for me to figure out how to do transition well. But things like Cengage and Vital Source and the very big publishers are going to do transition really well. So far, Sakai, Moodle, and Blackboard are going to do transition really well. And I think that Canvas and D2L will be shamed into doing transition really well now that Blackboard has kind of let it slip that they're going to do a good job of it. And that makes me excited because it's good for all of us to do transition right. Um, but the other 900 out of 1,000 LTI tools are going to do transition badly. And what that means is when you, can, when you go from Piazza LTI 1.1 to LTI 1.3, Piazza is going to complete, create completely new accounts and lose all history that you've ever used in Piazza with LTI 1.1 and have no way to reconnect it. Like you'd have to go back to launching them LTI 1. And then what you would see is all your stuff that you did in Piazza before you switched to LTI 1.3, it's like you have two separate accounts. And there's no way Piazza is going to connect those together. And if they do, they'll do it in a crappy and insecure fashion. Uh, so transition is going to be a big deal. I'll just tell you that we in this room are in the catbird seat, especially the people who are the, the place, ground zero for the world's greatest LTI 1.1 to 1.3 transition is Dayton. Because Dayton is using Sugi and Sakai. And Sugi is awesome at transition, and Sakai is awesome at transition which means you guys can sit there and edit in your admin LTI 1.1, LTI 1.3, LTI 1.1, LTI 1.3, and nothing will break as often as you want, every day if you want. So uh, I think Moodle could if they tried, because it, it turns out it's easier for the LMS to do it than it is for the tool to do it. Uh, because the LMS simply has to know what it used to be and add a little tiny claim to the jot, and then it's up to the tool to figure it out. Uh, and so it took me two hours to do it in Sakai, and it took me 
a week and a half to do it in SUGI because I had to build all new data models, equivalences, and things that used to be the only unique key. Now I have two unique keys, and you know, and so uh, SUGI was hard. And so the tools are going to have the hardest part, but uh, but places like uh, Cengage and uh, and Vital Source, they have all along been building a middleware approach that's very SUGI-like, and they have dealt with this transition from LTI-1 to LTI-2, and they'll figure it out because they actually are built a very responsible. So they'll do the Cengage and Vital Source. If you looked at them, they look like SUGI. They they have very complex code to patch broken LTI-1 O and 111 launches from all the different vendors that are just funky and different. And so they're, they're in a position to, to do that transition nicely. Although I'm expecting that Cengage is going to do a batch transition, meaning that uh, Cengage, you'll do an LTI-11 launch, a series of LTI-11 launches. You'll create a series of history of your stuff in LTI-11. And then you will launch for a single user your first LTI-13 launch. And they're going to take that as a signal to convert that user to a, only a 1.3 user, which means Dayton won't be able to then go back to LTI 1.1 with Cengage because then that'll create a new account. So, but if you just go to LTI 1.3 and stay LTI 1.3 with Cengage, you'll be fine. So some of the vendors are going to see the, the existence of the transition claim as convert this account to a forever 1.3 account. I worked a little harder and I made it so that there is like multiple indexes that come to this thing. So that if it sees a 1-1 launch, like if you had a key in a secret and you're running Moodle in Sakai and you were talking to Tsugi and this Moodle is not yet converted to LTI 1.3 and Sakai is converted to LTI 1.3 and both of those things were using a Tsugi, you could go for years launching LTI 1.1 in the Moodle and 1.3 in Sakai and, and, and Tsugi would continuously find its way to the single user whereas Cengage won't. So you'll do it in Cengage, you'll convert Cengage LTI 1.3 in Sakai. Cengage will see that as a signal to completely rewrite that user history. And then it'll get a 1.1 launch, and it'll be like, oh, new person. And then the, from that point on, the Moodle people, and it won't see the signal anymore. It'll see the signal, but it's like, oh, I already converted that person, right? I mean, it could. It could, like, maybe suck the data in. I mean, we'll see. It's really hard. But we're in a good spot. We're in a good spot, meaning that whatever your tool vendor does, I made it so that you, it's just a simple CRUD admin interface. You can change the keys. You can do all this stuff. The SaaS people are making it so that like the local admins don't have as much control as Sakai and Moodle have given the local admins a ton of control. And you get to see everything. You get to change everything. You get to test everything. But again, with great power comes great responsibility and hopefully great documentation. So. Any other questions? Yeah. Yep. Right. So, so the question was about the issue of uh, copying LTI tools from one course to the when you copy a course. The destination LTI tools uh, are not properly provisioned. So we talked about that last week on the core call, actually, if I'm not mistaken. Um, there has been a long-running uh, two different opinions between me and Laura Geckler from Notre Dame. And I won for a while, but La Laura has won. Um, so the reason, so what I what I did is. <laughs> I was afraid of copying keys and secrets into new classes in case that was a different person and they could see keys and secrets in the new class, right? I, it's not that hard to copy, but it's, there's, this, there's a sensitive information that I was afraid. Now, Blackboard actually has a patching tool that patches it after the fact if you do that. And so, but we just broke. So, um, but it was broke enough and it annoyed enough people that it's been fixed. So it's, I think there's a fix in trunk already that kind of partially fixes it, that the admin goes into the new site and clicks it, and that on first launch it actually copies across the data into that site that it needs to, to work. So, I, so we're committed, if that still doesn't fix that, but 
that was just put in trunk like last week. So that's been a problem. And we've even come up with some better solutions that we'll kind of play with that, that assuage my concern about exposing secrets to the new teacher in that next class. So that should work, I think, if you have global tools, but not if you have in tools installed in the class is where it falls down, I think. I hope. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and so, so at this point, we have almost nothing that's an as user, right? It's as tool, right? So we have nothing that's as user, um, i.e., I am a logged in user and I, somebody just took away access to this thing. This is really Piazza has permission to do X. And so if you think about this, this is all the checkboxes in the LTI 1.1 administration tool that's, that's being checked here, right? Are you in this site? Is this tool allowed to do this? Is this tool in the site? Da 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 da. -da. That's the kind of stuff that's going on here. Now, I, as we talked before, if we're going to do this pattern for more short-lived user-oriented services, we've got to solve that. And the answer is, you could, in, you could come up with something that just said, nope, that token. You could come up with something like a caching layer in here that basically the moment you mint a token, you would like check a cache, you'd put it in a cache here, and then um, you would the thing it would come in and would like check the signature of the token, check the cache, yes, it's still there, um, and then say yes. Or if you came in here and some other process wiped out that cache entry, you can refuse this. You can basically say, you can say, no, nope, your token expired. And that's exactly what happens if you wait too long. But it doesn't have to wait until 3,600 seconds have elapsed. You could just, if we were smart enough in here to have a lightweight way of revoking one of these things, you could have it done a millisecond later, right? You'd revoke, you'd revoke it here. And then this guy's got to respect the fact that it's going to be told. Because it might not have the right time or whatever. This thing you know, might have started the timer a few seconds earlier or whatever. And so this thing has to always be ready to be told no. And then when it's told no at any one of these things, it goes back up to here. And then if it's told no, then you kind of know like, well, it's never going to be yes. I mean, it's not, it's not likely to become yes. You can say it became no during usage. Let's check to see if I can get it. Oh, no, I can't. But you can invalidate these. I have no mechanism for doing that because we don't need it. But if we were to generalize this approach so that you can hoist the heavyweight stuff up on a series of a lot of API calls. And in a sense, you can think about the session that we do in our current API pattern is that's kind of a lightweight check to see if you're the right person. And this token is kind of like a session ID, right? It's not that different than a session ID. So who knows? what lightweight way we could sort of validate those and revoke them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so if Earl ever finishes, is like, I'm going to give you a magical cache that just works everywhere across clusters, then we can do stuff like that quite easily. And these things can be gone. You know, and it, yeah, so. Any other questions? Earl didn't even hear the burn that I, sick burn that I, okay, I did a sick burn on Earl, and uh, not a real sick burn. 
<laughs> Jacks. <laughs> yeah. I just like laid out a sick burn and was like, I did it's wasted. Okay, any other questions? How much time do I got, Alexa? Okay. Alexa, are you the NSA? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I'll be around. Thanks for uh, thanks for listening, and it's a uh, it's an exciting time, and we'll all learn. Uh, if you, uh, I uh, I wrote this because Matthew and I were talking, and he, I just was. I'm like, oh crap! I'm going to answer a lot of questions. Matthew just happened to be the first person to run into it, and I'm like, how about Matthew? I will write you documentation. So the next person that shows up, I will just say, read the documentation. So. I'm trying to make this as easy as possible. I'll probably fold this somewhere into the Sakai source tree in a README or something, so it's not just you got to go to Sugi to figure it out, because in a way, I'll write documentation that's like for any tool and put that in the Sakai source tree. But this is the best stuff I've got right now. Okay? Thanks. <laughs>